everybody. Welcome to another episode of the TF Podcast, where we discuss technology and finance, uh, typically revolving around Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and blockchain. Uh, a lot of interesting things happening uh, in the world today, and I'm really excited for uh, my next guest, who is Nadia Hewitt. Uh, she is part of the World Economic Forum, and uh, they're doing lots of great things as an organization uh, in really all aspects of, of kind of technology, finance, and, and, and that. And I'd love if uh, you could introduce yourself to everybody, please. Hey, morning, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. I'm Nadia Hewitt. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, I'm with the World Economic Forum. More specifically, I'm at, the, uh, at our office in San Francisco. So the office in San Francisco opened up about three years ago, and it's called the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, most of you might know the World Economic Forum from Davos. It's better known for Davos, the big conference that takes place in Switzerland um, every January. But uh, the World Economic Forum is the uh, sort of intersection, uh, the company international organization where public and private um, comes together to improve the state of the world. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I'd love if you could kind of, yeah, just touch a little bit more on that. So, you know, how did the World Economic Forum come about? How long has it been around? Um, you know, yeah, just, I guess, start from there. <laughs> yeah. So actually in January this year, we celebrated, uh, the forum celebrated 50 years. Um, so that's a long time. It started off again, it, it's sort of that international organization for public private intersections. It started off 50 years ago with the idea that to solve some of the world's most critical challenges, you need to have public and private work together. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and more and more, I think we see that with the world we're moving in, you know, COVID, of course, uh, unpre unprecedented times. Um, you see that with emerging technologies, you know, you cover Bitcoin, blockchain, crypto a lot. Um, in that, it's really more and more needed for, pub, uh, for the private sector to lean in, right? right. They can't just rely on, on governments and regulation and legislation to, to solve it all. Um, can't keep up regulation. So the idea of, um, yeah, governments, organizations, academia, and so working together is, is, is more and more critical to solve critical challenges. So the World Economic Forum um, convenes. Uh, we provide that safe space for C-suite, head of states, organizations um, to work together. And really, at the end of the day, we bring best minds together. We, you know, um, uh, yeah, again, so kind of uh, a synthesis of, what some experts and best minds and you know those in charge and heading up and leading important things um can bring to the world and then we help and share it to make sure that we level the playing field for all that um, everybody yeah. is in gets to participate well i mean definitely see the need for that right when, when when you see a lot of these new innovative companies uh coming about a lot of times you know they're those companies are creating things that don't uh, work in the current paradigm, you know, or like, so like, yeah, new regulation needs to be created, you know, for what they're trying to do. Um, you know, that's part of what yep. is that innovation. So I, I definitely see, uh, yeah. you know, that need so, overall. So Jonathan, with the, at the center, which they opened three years ago in San Francisco, so Professor Klaus Schwab, he's the founder and chairman of the World Economic Forum. He's been already for a while, um, I'm going to say concerned, but, you know, thinking through the implications of emerging technologies. Um, and mm -hmm. he calls that the fourth industrial revolution. So, you know, the first, second, third industrial revolution um, brought about big changes in the world. But in the fourth industrial revolution are these technologies like blockchain and distributed ledger technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, Internet of Things like connected devices, sure. drones, precision medicine, and so on. So um, he uh, believes and kind of we, why we then started the center three years ago in San Francisco is that these technologies will fundamentally change industries and yeah. um, not only industries like previous revolutions, it will, it has the potential to change and, and challenge what it means to, to be human. You know, if you think about mm -hmm. artificial intelligence or or blockchain autonomous software agents doing business on behalf of, of humans, right? And he was worried that, that the world is not prepared um, for these changes. 
um, especially responsible. You know, we know that these technologies have a potential to solve some of our most pressing problems, but um, the steering it in a responsible way, right? And how you deploy it is so important. Sure. And yeah. that's, that's the whole idea. And again, thinking about public private sector, governments, these, these technologies are moving very fast, right? Government's regulation <laughs> can't keep up. It's like here. So you have a gap. Mm -hmm. And that governance gap is where the World Economic Forum then has a unique position, um, given our, you know, 50 years and, and our network and methodologies, our multi-stakeholder approach to sort of help address some of these governance gaps that um, with these emerging technologies. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I can definitely see the need for that. I mean, I remember when... Um, you know, a few years ago when with the Facebook privacy issue that took place, right, um, with the Cambridge Analytica stuff. And, you know, obviously that was wrong. Um, but what I was super surprised about was during the hearings, um, just the lack of uh, knowledge that the senators that were, you know, investigating had about like how privacy worked, right? And how, or, and how the technology elements work, just like, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, while there were obviously valid concerns, there was also just uh, a total gap there. So yeah, I can definitely see the need for making sure yeah. that, you know, both sides, you know, are communicating properly. Absolutely. I mean, you're talking privacy now, which is such a critical um, uh, issue, problem, importance, yeah. uh, success factor that we need to get right, right, with these technologies. But then you start talking about these emerging technologies and you think about cybersecurity, right? And you think yeah. about overall data confidentiality and um, biases and responsible use, right? We bringing toys today into our homes and these toys have you know, artificial intelligence, it's, 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 it, it brings any biases and, and things that those coders have brought into the technology. So it's just connected devices, you know, it's our fridges, everything's connected. Incredible potential for these technologies, again, to solve big problems, but governing it and making sure that, it, that it's used responsibly and also inclusive. You know, mm -hmm. for us, the inclusivity piece is, is very big, inclusive being how do you make sure the whole world can participate and take advantage of these technologies? Um, yeah, so yeah. important stuff. <laughs> no, oh, definitely, definitely. And so, you know, when you think of, you know, like, like you mentioned when you're introducing um, the World Economic Forum, as, you know, a lot of people know it for Davos, and, it, you know, it's such a big uh, conference of, of, of um, you know, very intelligent minds and uh, of, from all, all sectors. Um, how, what, what would be a good way to kind of explain how the World Economic Forum operates, you know, outside of Davos, right? Like what, mm. what, what's kind of like the day-to-day -day of what the Economic Forum is working on, um, mm. you know, overall yeah, yeah. To, to kind of help understand. That's a very that. good question. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for asking that because that's really where, um, where we care, and where we really put a lot of work and attention and where most of us spend our time is outside of conferences, outside of Davos. It's, um, so we lead a number of projects, I would say. I mean, I, I, I don't know a total number, but if you 200 or more problems that spans industries, that spans verticals, that spans systems, that spans platforms. Um, if you look at um, the platforms that the World Economic Forum leads, initiates and convene, you're talking about platforms such as the future of mobility, the future of you know advanced manufacturing the future of uh, digital economy the future of blockchain data policy and 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 any and, and all of of these um systematic issues that has a profound impact on um economies both mm -hmm. emerging digital uh, developed developing world and the World Economic Forum, what we do, we bring the multi-stakeholder approach. So multi-stakeholder mean looking at these problems that cuts across these platforms. We, the, the multi-stakeholder approach is over the 50 years that we've been, that, that, that's, that's very important for us. So multi-stakeholder meaning we want um, to take an holistic approach to problems. We want nobody and, and no part of it to be an afterthought. And really making sure that we bring best minds, top in class, you know, bringing those players together 
from both public and private sector, mm -hmm. allowing all of them to lean in. And um, yeah, and, and through that multi-stakeholder approach, lead projects. So projects being, it's not us coming up with the solutions. We are convening, um, we are convening uh, all of these different players, academia, orga uh, organizations, Fortune, you know, Fortune 50, small, medium-sized enterprises, technologists, experts, governments, um, ministries, civil society, international organizations. So we really represent, we, we convene these different groups around these problems. And then we provide an impartial, an impartial convening platform, a safe space for this multi-stakeholder approach to, mm -hmm. um, to share protocols, to share uh, policies, to bring best practices, and then to be able to scale it across the world and, and make it available using the World Economic Platform. And I've, really, I've not really ever understood the power of, of the platform and the ability to scale work um, until I've started to really work on my own projects. So mm -hmm. I can tell you one example of my project, if you think it's good for us to maybe walk through one more, one yeah. concrete project, maybe to get an idea. So one yeah, of definitely. these projects, to give you an idea of the multi-stakeholder approach, is, is in blockchain. So you'll love it, both Jonathan, mm -hmm. in your, your area of interest. So blockchain technology has a lot of potential um, in you know, finance, insurance, healthcare, and so forth. And we've seen a lot of exploration in supply chains. But mm -hmm. then... Uh, rewind, rewind two years ago, a lot of the exploration was very uh, bilateral of nature. You know, so it was one or two organizations who were coming together and, um, you know, experimenting with blockchain. And as you know, that's not how you take best advantage of the features that blockchain has to offer, right? It's sure. the ultimate network technology. You have to, um, in order to really uh, unlock the potential, you, you know, you need a multilateral approach. So we wanted to make sure that it's not, you know, a fragmented approach, because if it's fragmented and you just look after the interest of one or two parties, there's a, a potential that it just creates more mistrust, where you're right. actually trying to bring more trust into the system, right? So um, the World Economic Forum, many of our partners, governments and uh, private organizations said, you know, you need to help, you need to we, there's a number of issues of how blockchain is being deployed. It's, 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 it's not multilateral enough. We need to involve more people. It's not inclusive enough. You know, there's parts of the world, um, parts of the supply chain that's being told to get onto blockchain, but they're not really empowered to make certain decisions. You know, if you think about a lot of importers or retailers, they, they will tell their upstream supply chain, you need to get on. This is what we're doing. And they're yeah. not really necessarily part of the conversation. They, they're not empowered with information to understand if the technology brings more value, how right. do you ensure like, fair allocation of value? Yeah, and it seems like in a lot of those situations, like they're participating by providing information, but not necessarily getting the value wow. out of the consortium of exactly. information. You know. Exactly, because if you, if you assume, assuming there's a real problem and blockchain is the appropriate technology and assuming that it's bringing value, that additional value is being allocated somehow, right? And how do yeah. you make sure it's more inclusive? Other problems at the time, which still to today very much exist, is the hype, right? There was a lot of hype. Um, sure. People were being educated. So, so our partners were telling us we are educated today by the media, which many times were giving us confusing you know, and contradicting statements, or we're being educated by the vendor who's selling a technology solution to us. Yeah. So how do we really know what, it, you know, so they're like, we need impartial information. We need <clears throat> guidance. And because it was such a new technology, there wasn't yet much guidance out there available to decision makers in supply chain. And when I say supply chain, I'm really talking about a hundred plus use cases, right? You're talking about trade finance through to port optimization, documentation, track and trace provenance, et cetera. And then the World Economic Forum kicked off this 18-month project, which is a multi-stakeholder approach to bringing impartial best practice information on blockchain technology to decision makers. Um, and we, at the end of the day, we engage more than 200 organizations. So you're talking about 200 organizations who's done blockchain deployments. And we sort of went, we Googled their minds, you know, did the hard work and extracted the information but mm -hmm. otherwise, you, you wouldn't have learned about those failures or best practices and experts. 
and engage experts. So, you know, anything from through workshops, virtual workshops, we were ahead of the curve. We've been doing virtual workshops already the last, you know, two years in this project. Um, white papers, just a lot of dialogue, a lot of uh, um, sharing of best practices. And that then finally sort of shaped what we launched um, two weeks ago, um, what we call the Redesigning Trust Blockchain Deployment Toolkit. So it's, um, there's an online version and a printable version and it's available, it's, it's open source, you can, it's available to anyone that wants to go and get sort of a structured blockchain deployment framework and tools and resources. And it's also very much relevant to, to others in other domains, finance and others. A lot of what's in there can be used for other domains if you are rolling out blockchain technology. So that's one example of the forum, sort of convening all of those players, right? Yeah. Using our platform to, to put something like that out to the world, which will then level the playing field and make um, those best practices and really give companies the ability to embed best practices and avoid costly missteps and get access to all of those type of experts that many don't typically have access to, especially sure. if you, you're a small, medium-sized enterprise. Yeah, so you help kind of like co coordinate and facilitate the consortium of, of folks or companies that would be involved, right? Very interesting. Correct, yes. Yeah, no, it's super interesting. And, and uh, you know, obviously supply chain gets used a lot as a use case, um, you know, for blockchain. Um, but, you know, it's, it's great. You know, congrats on, on that new announcement. It's, it's interesting to see, especially because, um, you know, a lot of people talk about blockchain and, you know, how decentralized is it or it should be decentralized. But I think one thing that people forget in a, in a business context is that, you know, as long as it's decentralized, for the consortium, right? Like for the folks that are involved in it, then like, you know, perhaps that is decentralized enough, right? Like obviously like this wouldn't be something that would be in a completely public ledger because that doesn't make sense. A business wouldn't operate, um, you know, in that, in that way. Um, and, you know, kind of the way, the way I like to look at it and I think about those sort of things, because sometimes someone might compare like, well, you know, Bitcoin is like this decentralized ledger and like, that's why it's great. And I agree with that. It's like, right, like that is, those are all the reasons why that makes Bitcoin really interesting. But like, it doesn't mean that there can't be a blockchain type of aspect, right? It doesn't yeah. have to be, you know, one well, or the other. That's yeah. just my opinion. Like, I'm still, exactly. I'm, I'm very <laughs> bullish about Bitcoin. And like, from a, like, when you think about how cryptocurrency operates, for example, um, mm. to me, like, that's been like the one that's obviously proven out and has product market fit. Um, and it's kind of like for those reasons is why I, I like it. But, you know, when I, if I put my business, my, my, I'm a product manager, if I put my product manager hat on, it's like, yeah, and I need to make sure that all these uh, groups work well together. Um, it seems like, you know, kind of what you're describing is something that would make sense, you know. Yeah. Towards that so, path. Jennifer, that's a, yeah, that's actually a very loaded question. It is also a very important question. And I mean, yeah. I, we can talk for hours and hours about totally. this whole decentralization and, you know, enterprise type systems. And for me, that has been um, one of the, the biggest reveals as well during this project. Let me tell you, I mean, we could get stuck for weeks at a time yeah. having more philosophical discussions on, you know, does a public permission system exist? What is a public permission? Does it exist? You yeah. know, like getting completely sidetracked. And I think that was one of the problems that um, a lot of supply chain leaders or, you know, again, other leaders in other domains were faced with a blockchain because they had all these vendors selling to them solutions and the vendor will say, oh, we are the first ever neutral solution or we are the only public solution. And they just got so confused as to, you know, what is public and what is private and when right. is it really public? And where, and also why we remind at the forum and, and, and in the toolkit, we remind organizations, don't get sidetracked on this whole public versus private and what is the exact definition of public? And I mean, you'll, 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 you'll for hours, people won't agree. At the end of the day, what's essential is if you have a real problem and, and blockchain is the appropriate technology to solve it, which there are many use cases where it has huge potential and it, if it's, it's done right, it can bring value to the players involved, um, then you should deploy that system that meets your requirements. You have key requirements and you should be, uh, you should be 
navigating and designing and developing a system that best meets those requirements. And totally. if you can get that right, then it doesn't mean at the end of the day too much exactly where and what it's for. Um, that being said, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, enterprises, they have a number of, of requirements they have to meet. Blockchain is no different from any other IT solution that you know, enterprise type have to deploy. You know, they need to have operational integrity. You need to have known and trusted partners. So you can't have a fully public permission list because within the enterprise world, you have auditing controls, you have tax implications. You know, those are just, you know, certain things that you have to meet. So those requirements are no different for blockchain than any other IT solution. A blockchain mm. at the end of the day is one tool in your overall digitization journey, right? Exactly. It's, um, so I think with, with, when you talk about supply chains, and I would very much say even so finance, where, where you're really using blockchain to streamline operations, uh, the, the, the important thing is also to look at processes. So a lot of the supply chain processes are, have been designed for very centralized operations and systems. So you have centralized processes designed and developed and catering for centralized systems and then you're trying to bring that processes under more decentralized um, systems and, and that is not you can't just make that happen so it's important that you when you choose your solution you also look at choosing it for processes that is a natural fit for decentralized processes mm -hmm. and you know what you're not going to be able to overnight just switch to decentralized or become more decentralized depending on your, your yeah. definition of what decentralization is. But so with these organizations, um, it is not a right or a wrong, like you have to be one or the other. There's a balance, right? So yeah. you can, there, there, there's, a, there's a bringing in a centralized, bringing in centralized components with decentralized components is very much how you probably will end up see many of these more enterprise solutions play out as, and that's yeah. okay. And I, I think agree. there's a piece where over time you go more decentralized, you know, especially as many of these processes were not designed to have decentralization in mind. So it's a work in progress, right? Yeah. Um, but I do always, always call out as well the importance of remembering that a lot of the features of blockchain has to do with the distributed nature, right? The decentralized aspect. That's where a lot of the features are unlocked. So every time you are adding more centralized components or, you know, you add more permissions, you add more, you are diluting a lot of the, of the benefits that blockchain technology brings. Sure. So adding, adding more centralized components, you have to ask yourself, at what point then is blockchain really still making sense? And at what point can I just as well be using, you know, traditional technologies? So right. we have to keep ourselves honest and, and, and organizations do need to keep themselves honest. but you're very much correct in that you can't take that sort of black and white worldview on it as, as you find many of the, you know, Bitcoin, you know, community will do. It doesn't, it, it, it's yeah. unfortunate. It's, yeah, it doesn't work. Like yeah. And, and, and I think it's fine. I mean, like that, that's always been my point of view. Like, so for me, like I said a second ago, is that I'm, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. I'm a big believer in Bitcoin. Like when, when we think about how from a cryptocurrency perspective, like I only care about Bitcoin. But, you, you know, as a technologist, you know, I like to think of myself as a technologist solving problems. You know, whenever I'm solving a problem, if I'm building a product or I'm working with a company at building a product, I don't care what the technology is. Like you just said a moment ago, I need it to solve my requirements. Right. And so right. it's like, OK, so my requirements is are, you know, like I need multiple people to have access to something or, you know, mm -hmm. I need people to have this be be able to access this in the future. I'm not going into it as a technologist and saying like, OK, I have blockchain and I need to insert blockchain into this or I have like, you know, some point system. So I need to insert cryptocurrency into this. Right. It's not it's not that way. It's the opposite. So. You know, when you start thinking about that as a technologist, you might find that, okay, there's elements that we can take from blockchain that work. And like you said a second ago, like there's elements of, you know, how traditional mm. tech has worked in the past that we mm. can take. So we'll probably mm. blend some of those things together Absolutely. to make it work. Absolutely. And um, at the end of the day, like, is this considered a blockchain like you know, maybe it was intended to in the very, very beginning when someone started thinking about the altruistic vision of that, maybe not. 
But does that matter from a business context, you know, to make sure that the business is operational and functional? Probably not either, right? And so I think that's what I find really interesting. And um, it's like, yeah, if if, if we're just be, you know, business minded, because I think it's a little, you know, it's slightly irrational to think that everything is going to be like super public and very distributed from a business context, because Mm. um, if, you know, businesses have IP or want IP, right. And like, they want to grow revenue and they want to increase profit for shareholders. Like that's how business really runs. You know, you, you, right. it doesn't make sense to make it available uh, in every yeah. context, unless the, it's the pieces that make it more operationally Absolutely. efficient. And I mean, it's, and if you talk about just <clears throat> something as, I say it's as simple because there's nothing simple about this, but something as simple as, as, personal data handling and personal data rules so you have local and you have extraterritorial rules that dictates that companies aren't allowed to share personal data of somebody mm-hmm. like you you used the example previously of, of of what happened with facebook if you look at gdpr it's a european union rule that i mean the fines are up to three percent i think uh, was it three or five percent i'm not 100 percent sure it's, yeah i know it's high it's Either astronomical way. i mean i just at that point at that number my so it's just you know you have to build solutions that works for that and i also think that you it, it's it's a cultural it's a parad, it's a paradigm shift and it's not mm-hmm. going to happen overnight so i think allowing organizations to also get into uh systems that might you know be uh, more permission than it maybe necessarily in the long run needs to be. If you can just use it in uh, simple terms like that, say more permissions. That's also a way to get them acquainted, to make them, because many today aren't very open to it, right? There's still a lot of hype and misconception about the technology. So that's also a way to get organizations open to the technology. It's also mm-hmm. a way for them to then start having dialogue with the regulators around how rules, how laws can be changed to be more accommodating, right? Because laws weren't written with decentralization in mind, sure, right? right? With the idea of having nodes in many different jurisdictions. So I, I believe it's also a necessary step for us to take, right? To get everybody's sort of feet wet in a way and that way go into a world where we can tap and unlock more of the, the the type of benefits that are that are fully public and permission and system will hold for um you know even the enterprise world yeah yeah, yeah i think one thing that i just kind of thought about right now for the first time is uh you know i think part of the tension that has happened be between like you know like this fully public uh you know anonymous type of scenario versus like the perceived you know not real blockchain of an enterprise right I think actually part of that tension has been created by what has been left in the middle, meaning um, some of these startups that like kind of promised everything, right? And so, um, you know, I've, I've been a startup guy most of my life. So, you know, I can't blame someone, you know, as long as they were acting with good intent, right? As long as they weren't being malicious. But, you know, I can't blame someone for like saying like, we're going to disrupt everything and whatever. Mm-hmm. But you, you had a lot of these, you know, startups or, you know, even cryptocurrencies come out that said that they were going to handle supply chain or they were going to hand decentralized everything and, and so forth. And, you know, you have the Bitcoin side that's saying like, you're not decentralizing anything, which they weren't. Right. And, um, and so it's like that, that, so then you have like the enterprise folks when they're thinking about blockchain, it's almost like that middle ground messed it up for them. And then same on the, on the enterprise side is you had like those middle folks saying like, oh yeah, we're going to decentralize everything and it's going to be public. And it's like, well, I don't want that. Like, why would, why, why would I even participate in that? Right. Yeah, so, exactly. So exactly. So that, that had a lot to do with the hype and just misinformation yeah. and then expectations and, right. you know, then people, so that's a, a big, 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 big part of the toolkit as well is sort of to cut through that hype and to um, really still show that there's a lot of potential. I mean, we looked in depth at more than 40 use cases. Um, that we sort of really extracted learnings and lessons from and, and sort of in the supply chain sphere um, that we then, um, where we then include sort of resources and tools in the toolkit. So there's absolute value there. But yes, it's sort of realigning expectations and knowing that, you know, if I, if I, um, if I open the lid or if I look under the cover, 
I'm not going to find 100% bold blockchain solutions. In yeah. fact, many of them are only like a little piece because again, blockchain is just one piece of our overall tech stack, right? Sure. And many times you need um, internet of things. You need, you need um, other technologies to work and complement and work together with blockchain to really achieve the data integrity and the things that we need. Yeah. So, but very exciting, uh, uh, definitely a space that will grow and a space that we've seen um, have got an increased interest with COVID, right? In this new world, the timing of the toolkit in many ways is great because the focus is supply chains, but mm -hmm. it really, uh, we've seen such a spike in interest in what can emerging technologies do to help us, one, address pandemic responsiveness and readiness, but then more so the long-term view on as we build systems going forward, we know the supply systems aren't working, right? The, right. This time have exposed a lot of the weaknesses. So as we build system for the future, what's the role of emerging technology in that? Yeah. And how does it help us with economic recovery and economic rebound? Um, and we've really seen the tech community step up across the world to um, both address the sort of short-term COVID miti risk mitigations, but also help build long-term solutions. So very excited to see what these fourth industrial revolution technologies yeah. bring. And, and my guess is when you say, you know, like there's lots of interest, you know, especially with COVID and so forth, you know, my guess is going back to what we were talking about a moment ago with like you fulfilling requirements is that the, the people that are expressing interest are saying like, wow, um, you know, I need a better supply chain solution, right? Or I, yeah, I, I need to better understand you know, uh, how things are being shipped or tracked or, you know, I'm not getting access to certain things. Now that this COVID thing's happening, I, ha I have less visibility into what's happening. So, you know, my guess is it's that it's not, oh my gosh, you have a blockchain thing? Let me learn no. more about blockchain, right? No, I, yeah, <laughs> so I think it's this, absolutely. Thank goodness, if we can move past that phase, yeah. right, where we were two years or a year ago, where people are like, oh, you, you blocked it? Oh, let's open the door. No, it's like, well, it's we kinda... can't do this. We need to solve this. It's a new, we need to solve this that so we open to now really explore and see what the potential is. Yes. Yeah. I think back in the day, people were using blockchain kind of like a prescription drug commercial in the yeah. sense of like, you know, you watch it, you see a prescription drug commercial, I don't know, whatever it's for. And then you go to the doctor and be like, I need that drug, right? As opposed to saying like, yeah. hey, I have these symptoms. I have these requirements. You know, what, what can I be used? Absolutely. So, yeah, so. <laughs> you, know, you know, with that, I'd love to, yeah, let's dig into a little bit of that. You know, how has... Um, you know, the, how has COVID kind of changed the way that the World Economic Forum thinks about, um, you know, just really how you're operating uh, and, um, you know, the responses that people are taking? How, how has that impacted uh, just how, how you're bringing about, bringing about your messaging and what you're doing? Yes. So there will be definitely more to come in the next few months as we work with our partners to help shape uh, economic recovery to help shape what supply systems and other looks like for the future. For now, um, I, it has only shown the importance of these impartial conveners that brings multi-stakeholder approaches to problems. It's only shown the relevance of an organization like this because more than ever, we need for countries to work together. I think with a lot of the uh, geopolitical tension and you know there's a lot of uh, issues going on right now political and, and other so I even more so then it's relevant for us to have that that impartial convening platform where governments around the world can come together and more importantly where private sector can lean in to help solve some of the problems so um, already now for a few months the World Economic Forum has in place a COVID action platform so there's, um, this has provided a platform for our partners, so both government and private sector, academia, civil society, and so on, to uh, bring and, and address some of the COVID issues. So if you go in, and I encourage everybody to go and visit the COVID action platform, uh, there's wonderful initiatives from our partners. Um, on the platform, we have partnered with the World Health, World Health Organization and a number of of companies who's, who's doing a number of things. And you'll find projects on there. I think I, I checked last week, there were more than 30. I'm, I'm not, not keeping up. But these projects are addressing anything from, 
you know, using emerging technologies to solve uh, track and trace of, of COVID infections and to share and allow for best practices through to um, advanced manufacturing and the future of that and how and what does how 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 does the world address problems together and also just more immediate uh, actions like some of our partners stepping up and then donating masks or you know PPE equipment that's urgently needed and then on this impartial platform we have the ability to allocate it to its where it's most needed so the COVID action platform and a number of the projects on there um, it will very much be a way that we work with our partners um, to help solve immediate and, and long-term COVID issues. And then we also have, we have different communities. We have global shapers. Those are people under 30 around the world. Um, we have technology pioneers. We have young global leaders. We have a lot of these ecosystems that we've really seen stepping up. Um, you might be interested in it, Jonathan. The global shapers community, again, it's a community around in most countries around the world and they have hubs in you know they have a hub in san francisco and a hub in johannesburg and a hub in london and all these different hubs around the world where these young people work together and they come from different backgrounds and they for example um led by the san francisco hub worked with a dozen of other global shaper hubs uh, around the world and during the uh, april and may they had what was called block COVID. So Block COVID was an ongoing virtual uh, cooperation, collaboration between all these global shavers globally to bring technology. Really, Block COVID in this instance brings blockchain to solve some of the largest problems. And then they were, as, as technologists were stepping up and designing solutions during this Block COVID period, they were making available experts that, that, that helped them. Like, you know, they were bringing on uh, user design experts through to legal experts. Uh, I was on there at some point as well to sort of then help the community. So there's a lot of communities within the World Economic Forum that has really stepped up and globally are working together and solving, uh, uh, you know, aiming to solve many of the issues that COVID has brought about. Yeah, super interesting. You know, I, I, I that makes me kind of think about just the, you know, the, one of the biggest issues that COVID has brought about, obviously, is the world economy, right? So uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, call it weariness about what's happening uh, from a financial standpoint, even though the stock market seems to be doing fine. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, like, what, what has what's kind of your thoughts overall about that um, in, in, you know, and from your context in the sense of, um, you know, there's lots of unemployment going around along the world and, you know, industry has, has virtually uh, come to a standstill in, in certain sectors. Um, you know, what, what do you, what are kind of your thoughts overall on that? You know, what does that mean uh, in the short term and long term? Yes. yes. That's a very b a big question, broad question. <laughs> As the World Economic Forum, we then have these different platforms that addresses a number of the things in sort of a systematic way with our partners, one of them being the future of jobs. So we, we do a lot of work within the future of jobs aspect, and then again, working with our partners. I'm not a, per se an expert on that, um, so I'm not going to go into that. But at the center for the fourth industrial revolution, we're really looking at and working with our um, partners on what does emerging technology means for helping within the economic recovery and mm -hmm. putting geopolitical tensions aside digitization has a big potential to help with increasing trade with economic recovery so if you can open up if you can um, increased trade. I mean, before all of this, we had 16 trillion in, in trade, you know, moving borders. If we can reduce trade barriers and we can make it easier for people, so reducing trade barriers, anything as simple, uh, I say it's simple because it's not a simple thing, but as, you know, customs protection, you know, like as a good getting stuck at the border for two, three weeks because it's going through customs, when that good is, is really needed. Um, to do a function or trusted suppliers you know blockchain has this ability with the to help with trusted supplier verification you know everybody's asking the question who are the trusted partners who can i trust buying masks from ventilators from these things mm -hmm. um so the role that blockchain technology and in, in, in the larger digitization has to play or 
other technologies, really digitizing. Um, you read about, you know, money being also one of the uh, ways that COVID is being spread, right? So you already see many African nations that actually switch to digital payments on phones, which is wonderful, right? So they're minimizing the exchange of money, moving hands that, you know, can cause an increase in COVID. So just in general, digitization's ability to, um, to, to increase trade, reduce trade barriers, lower costs, and all of that has a large role to play in economic recovery. So that's a big piece of what we also focusing on at the center is to say, how can digitization, how can emerging technologies help in the economic recovery? And after all, this toolkit that I shared earlier um, is one response from the World Economic Forum. We accelerated the launch um, so that it is now available as the world are building systems for the future, right? Um, the toolkit will help with building resilience, transparency, and trusted data back into supply chains. We need trusted data. Trust is at an all time low. So you, you talk about the foundation of an economic recovery. You talk about a foundation of, of um, consumer, you know, confidence and happiness and, and so on and so on. It's, how do you bring trusted data into supply systems? How do you bring trusted data in, in many aspects of how we work with governments? And we're really looking there at the potential of, of technology. Uh, one quick last mention, um, I, I can't speak about it too much. It's being launched in a, in a, in a few weeks, but we've worked with the, the government of Colombia on using blockchain technology in procurement, government procurement to reduce corruption. So the oh, ability that you have, yes. So, you yeah. know, in corruption, uh, tenders, uh, government tenders are used, huge piece of, of where, unfortunately, sometimes corruption takes place. Um, so the ability of, of blockchain technology where you, you can make it public, so you can see um, who's bid what, you can make sure that the terms and conditions are encoded. Nobody can go and change conditions along the way to sure. sort of match what. So um, that's being, we, we have a framework that will launch around building trust back into, um, you know, government procurement on the back of what we've seen and learned with our partner, you know, the, the um, country in uh, Colombia. So th those are all things that, that those are, you know, you're building trust back and, and that essentially will be very important um, in any economic recovery and building systems of the future. Super interesting. Yeah, I feel like we could talk about this stuff for hours, um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, we got to end it sometime, right? <laughs> but, you know, I would love my last question to be a question that I ask everybody uh, to you, and that is, what is a question that you have? Um, that you would like to leave our listeners with as they go about their day that they can kind of just think about? Yes. So I would say as um, listeners who's involved in rolling out technology or these emerging technologies, and believe me, all of you are in some way or another um, involved and will at some point in time be making some decisions that has an impact on how um, technology is deployed, shared, uh, used in a responsible way. I think I, I really challenge everybody to think about always, how do you make it inclusive? How do you share the benefits of what technology has with others, whether it's your local ecosystem, whether it's making resources available to the rest of the world, but we have to level the playing field. We need to think about countries, teams, organizations that um, that do not get to participate and you always have learnings even as a user even if you use technology right if you use technology uh, you can challenge the provider your your um, if you buy something in a supermarket that tells you through a QR code that something is organic right and you you feel that information is not clear there's a responsibility in um, bringing that back and ensuring that it's inclusive. So sort of what is it that you can do in your sphere of influence to make sure that the way that we deploy technologies um, is inclusive. And yeah, love it. Love keep it. that aim. Yes. Awesome. Hey, Nadia, what's a good way for people to either follow you or stay in touch with you and so forth uh, in the future? Yes. So Nadia Hewitt, H-E-W-E-T-T, -T. it's an E-T-T, -T. everybody goes for I-T-T, -T. 
on LinkedIn is, is typically the, the easiest way to sort of keep track. Um, and then you can also email us at the forum at blockchain at webforum.org. So W-E-F-O-R-U-M.org, blockchain at webforum.org if you had any specific questions. And yeah, have a look at the COVID action platform by the forum and go and check out Redesigning Trust Blockchain Deployment Toolkit and make sure to share that with your network. Thank awesome. you, Jonathan, for your yeah. time. This is wonderful. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, everybody else, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the TF uh, podcast. Uh, please make sure that you're subscribed across your channels, uh, uh, whether that be Apple, um, Spotify, YouTube, uh, and also make sure that you're following us on social. I'm at JG Product, and there's at TF Blockchain, and uh, we'll be getting more great episodes like this to you soon. Uh, if you like it, please fill in those stars. Uh, it goes a long way and share it with your friends and family. Thanks a lot, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.